This is the day that the Lord has made. Let us be glad and rejoice in it. I was glad when they said unto me, let us go into the house of the Lord. For God has shown thee what is good. And what does the Lord require of thee but to do justly, to love mercy and to walk humbly with our God. Good morning. We welcome you this morning to the Andrew Rankin Memorial Chapel. And we pray God's blessings upon you as we seek to worship our God in spirit and in truth. We are indeed blessed to have as our preacher, Bishop Leah D. Daughtry. She is a nationally recognized organizer, activist, political strategist, author, and faith leader. Bishop Daughtry serves as presiding prelate of the House of the Lord Churches, the fourth in succession. Bishop Daughtry served as the Chief Executive Officer of the 2008 and 2016 Democratic National Conventions, making her the first person in Democratic Party history to hold the position twice. We welcome her to Howard University and to the Andrew Rankin Memorial Chapel. Pray for her as she comes to bring us a word from the Lord. This week's reading comes from the Gospel of Mark, chapter 1, verses 9 through 15. And it reads, In those days Jesus came from Nazareth of Galilee and was baptized by John in the Jordan. And just as he was coming up out of the water, he saw the heavens torn apart and the Spirit descending like a dove on him. And a voice came from heaven, You are my Son, the Beloved. With you I am well pleased. And the Spirit immediately drove him out into the wilderness. He was in the wilderness forty days, tempted by Satan, and he was with the wild beasts, and angels waited on him. Now, after John was arrested, Jesus came to Galilee, proclaiming the good news of God, and saying, The time is fulfilled, and the kingdom of God has come near. Repent and believe in the good news. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. I thank you for it all The good, bad, the ugly, great and small The times of victory and when I fall I'm so grateful that I'm still standing tall I thank you for my tears The pain helped me overcome my fears You've been good to me down throughout the years. It's a miracle that I'm still standing here. All that I am is because all that you brought me through. And everything I survive, it's all I'm 
I'm so grateful that I'm still standing tall. All that I am is because of all that you brought me through. And everything I survive is all because of you. I'm grateful for you. Let us prepare our hearts and our minds for prayer. Let us be still before our God. I love the Lord. He heard my cry. He pitied every groan. And as long as I live and trouble rise, I'll hasten to his throne. Most gracious and loving God, you formed us in love. And in your love, we live, we move, and have our being. You know our thoughts. You can feel our feelings. You know the places within us that are too sensitive for human hands to touch and words to comfort. You know the experiences that we have had that are unable to stand the touch of our own memories. Because you know us. Because you love us. Because you are a healer more than you are a judge. We come before you with open hearts and minds and ask that you search us, O oh God. Search the thoughts and attitudes of our hearts. Introduce us to ourselves, to our true selves, to the self you had in mind when you created us. As you search us, take from us whatever is keeping us from doing what is in our hearts to do things that were part of our past but do not belong in our future. Give us the strength to let go of what we cannot change, the strength to forgive others and to forgive ourselves. As you search us, O oh God, take from us the doubts and fears that keeps us from reaching for something new. As you search us, Help us to stop giving others the power to determine how we feel about ourselves. Help us to, to sense your affirming and loving spirit every moment of our lives. Come now, O oh God, and bring your healing to what is hurting within us. Calm any restlessness. Come now and rescue us from ourselves, from what we do to hold ourselves back. Free us now from always worrying about our weaknesses and fears rather than pursuing our hopes and our dreams. Deliver us, O oh God. Deliver us from our self-centeredness and fill us with compassion so that we can commit ourselves to something more important than our need for recognition and our need for praise. Help us to know Help us to know that even if there's no one to call our names, hold our hands, affirm our dreams, we can still be whole and we can still have joy. For you know our names. You hold us in your hands. And you cause us to dream dreams. And you love us with a love that will not let us go. We give you now. We give you all that we worry about. The people in our lives, the situation in our lives that need more than we can provide. As we surrender our concerns to you, O oh God, help us to relax in your spirit. Help us to know that it's not how much we can con control, but how much we can trust you that will make our lives better. Come now with your healing touch. Bring us through this pandemic. We pray for all who are grieving, 
May they, even in this moment, feel your presence and your comfort. Come and heal our sick nation. May this nation rise above hatred and bitterness and allow your truth and your justice to prevail. We're not going to try to tell you how to fix these things this morning. We're just going to let go now. And we're going to trust you. We're simply going to trust you. Now, adopt thy still dues of quietness until all our striving cease. Take from our souls the strain and the stress and let our ordered lives confess the beauty of thy peace. In your name we pray. Was the best thing I ever, ever done. Yes, falling in love with Jesus, oh my, falling in love with Jesus. Was the best thing I ever, I ever done. Cause I found out that in his arms said I feel protected. Yeah, in his arms never disconnected. Said I feel protected. There is no place I would rather, I'd rather be. Oh, falling, falling in love with this Jesus. My, my, my. Falling in love with Jesus. Falling in love with Jesus was the best thing I ever, I ever It's the best thing you've ever, you've ever done. Said I want you to know, it's the 
is the best thing I have ever, I've ever done. Good morning, family. First, we honor God, the creator of all things. We honor Jesus Christ, our Savior, who makes all things new. To Dean Richardson, we thank you for this honor and this opportunity to stand at this renowned and revered sacred desk to share a message from our God. We want to thank Reverend Duffy, the Rankin Chapel team, and the Howard University media team for the work they did to knit up all the details that made this possible. And lastly, I want to thank and honor my own church, the House of the Lord Churches, who have given me the great blessing of serving as their presiding prelate. I love you. Let us pray. God our Father, God our Mother, God our Creator, we thank you for this day, for all the days past, and all the days to come. We thank you for this opportunity to gather as community, to sing, to pray, and worship. I ask that you bless this message and that you give me the grace to share it with others as you have shared it with me. In your name we pray, amen. Our theme today is the fast that I choose. All over the world, Christians everywhere have entered the season of Lent, that time of year marked by reflection and preparation as we journey toward the resurrection. Ritually, nearly every observance of the Lenten season includes some kind of fast, a turning down of one's plate as a sign of sacrifice, as a spiritual discipline intended to strengthen spiritual muscles and bring us closer to the living God. With this in mind, our text today comes from the book of Isaiah, the 58th chapter, the 6th through the 12th verses. Read with me. Is not this the fast that I choose to loose the bonds of injustice, to undo the thongs of the yoke, to let the oppressed go free and to break every yoke? Is it not to share your bread with the hungry and bring the homeless poor into your house when you see the naked to cover them and not to hide yourself from your own kin? Then shall your light break forth like the dawn and your healing shall spring up quickly. Your vindicator shall go before you. The glory of the Lord shall be your rear guard. Then you shall call and the Lord will answer. You shall cry for help and he will say, here I am. If you remove the yoke from among you, the pointing of the finger, the speaking of evil, if you offer your food to the hungry and satisfy the needs of the afflicted, then your light shall rise in the darkness and your gloom shall be like the noonday. The Lord will guide you continually and satisfy your needs in parched places and make your bones strong and you shall be like a watered garden, like a spring of water whose waters never fail. Your ancient ruins shall be rebuilt. You shall raise up the foundations of many generations. You shall be called the repairer of the breach, the restorer of streets to live in and the word of the Lord is blessed. The fast that I choose. There is no doubt that we are living in challenging times. We stand at a crossroads in the nation, at the curious intersection of hopelessness and hopefulness. We come to this Lenten season wrestling with deep and pervasive societal and personal issues. This Lenten season finds us crossing a benchmark never imagined or seen before. In the nearly one year that we've been in lockdown, more than 400,000 lives have been snatched from us, stolen by a deadly virus, stealthy and mysterious and now variant. 
COVID-19 has exposed the inequities of our health care and economic systems as this pandemic ravages our communities in disproportionate numbers, devastating families and leaving grief and loss as our constant companions, disrupting our finances and forcing too many of us to choose between eviction and infection upending our routines and forcing us to learn new ways of living and being and doing. This Lenten season finds us separated from our family, friends and loved ones, from our church buildings and worship spaces as love demands that we try to stem the spread of this virus. This Lenten season finds too many of us on the brink of economic disaster as we face furlough, unemployment, and underemployment, on the edge of hunger as we try to survive on the goodwill of neighborhood food banks, charitable businesses, and innovative enterprises. This Lenten season finds us wrestling with our sanity and our mental health as we navigate isolation loneliness and grief, grief for our losses, grief for what might have been, and grief for what has become. This Lenten season, we face the aftermath of disastrous leadership at the highest levels in our country. Leadership that has unleashed all of our nation's worst instincts and impulses, giving permission to the worst underbelly of racists and sexists and homophobes to bring their hatred and bigotry out from under the rock where it had been hiding and taking center stage each and every day in new and astonishing ways. This Lenten season, we face a new the ongoing impact and effects of our nation's long and ugly history of racism. We have refused as a nation to deal honestly and forthrightly with this sin, and that's what racism is, sin, and our refusal to root it out and kill it has left it to continue to spread its tentacles in every new generation and in every area of our society. It affects where we live, where we go to school, the air we breathe, the water we drink, how we are protected, the wages we earn and the health care we receive. It is everywhere and in everything. This confluence of unfortunate circumstance has led many of us to look for God more fervently or to lean on God more heavily if we are looking and leaning at all. And we bring our fear, our anger, our confusion, our despair, our uncertainty, our questions to this Lenten season, and we ask, how shall we fast? How will God hear us? And how will God answer? How will God answer? when our nation and our communities and our people and we ourselves stand at the edge of despair in a place of brokenness and hopelessness at a crossroads of breached promises and unrealized dreams. But if we are honest, lest we get too lofty in our aspirations, we will have to admit that the problem is not just in the U.S. government or in the State House or in City Hall. Many of us, if we tell the truth, if we take off our masks, we'll have to admit that all is not well in our very own homes. Our relationships are fraying. If we've even been able to find a suitable mate, single or married, we're more likely to be living from paycheck to paycheck, using all of our creativity to make ends meet just one or two paychecks from homelessness. Our children are giving us headaches. Our health is an issue. We've experienced physical or mental or sexual trauma, and sometimes we even experience challenges in the places we thought to be a refuge. We have been wounded in the house of a friend or our family or our houses of worship. But lest we wallow in our despair and cry out in hopelessness, the word of God assures us that even in this, even through this, God offers us a solution, a way out. Now I know that all the church people gathering are waiting for me to get to the text. Well, here we go. 
In the passage of Isaiah that we read today, the prophet of God speaks to a people who, like us, are living in difficult times, surrounded by enemies who threaten their existence, led by insensitive religious leadership, and ruled by oppressive kings. They undertake a ritual fast, turning down their plates, tearing their clothing, praying loudly, beseeching God with all their might in the hopes that God would hear them, honor their faithfulness, and deliver them from their harrowing situation. But the word of God comes to them and comes to reject their fast, the form of their fast, the performative nature of their fast, the defiantly self-centered me, myself, and I root of their fast. And instead, God offers them a fast of God's own design, one that will unlock their spiritual potential, strengthen their spiritual bonds, and bring deliverance from the oppression that surrounded them. Now, there are two things I want you to notice in the passage today. First, God asks us to return to spiritual values and a deepening of our relationship with God's own self. Now, this might be interesting to some, that God's answer to societal, social, and personal problems is that we intensify our spiritual yearning that we reach out to God in fervor and with determination. He calls us to fast, yes, to turn down our plate, to ignore our natural physical desires, and to use that energy to seek God instead. But God doesn't just call for any old kind of fast. Turn down your plates, yes. Turn to God, yes, but more than that. While you are fasting, take care of the sick. While you are praying, feed the hungry. While you are worshiping, nurse the elderly. While you are praising, care for the weak and the infirm. While you are loving God, love your neighbor. God makes clear here that it is not enough for us to sit in our hallowed temples or at our private altars and pray for the less fortunate and send good thoughts to the disadvantaged and the disenfranchised. No, God expects us to do something, to not just talk about it, but to be about it, to act on it. It is important for us to note that the two go hand in hand. The spiritual quest is joined to social action. God says that to truly experience God's presence, to truly have relationship with God, our spiritual quest, our spiritual yearning must include the outward manifestation of God's love through our relationship with our brothers and sisters, the family of humankind. The second thing I want you to notice, once we have done this as God commands, If we do this, if we fast, if we seek God fervently, if we strengthen our relationship with God, our creator, and if we demonstrate this through our social witness, then we will be empowered to repair the breach. Then we will be empowered to restore hope and prosperity. Then we will have the authority to rebuild brokenness and broken places. Then we will have the ability to restore cities and communities. Then we will have the authority to repair marriages and family relationships. And then we will experience healing and peace and joy and abundance in our own lives and in the lives of our neighbors. It's an interesting paradox, really. To be healed, we have to heal others. To be refreshed and renewed, we must work to refresh and renew others. By tying our healing, our health, our peace, our joy to our ability to heal, love, and care for the other, it is as if God is saying that we are, in fact, the other. And the other is us. Almighty God, the creator of heaven and earth, puts the authority and the power in our hands. Through our actions, we are able to command the universe and hold God to God's word. If my people who are called by my name would humble themselves and pray and seek my face, then I will hear from heaven and heal their land. 
We know. We are all too aware of the dire needs in our communities and in our nation and in our homes and in our families. God knows this too. And God puts the solution in our hands. If we, God's people, take seriously our spiritual quest, seek God with all of our hearts, all of our minds, all of our bodies, then God gives us, his children, the ability and the, and the authority to change the situation, to lead our nation, our state, our city, our families, our homes, out of the breach of broken promises and despair and back to restored cities and prosperous streets. This is what God calls us to. This is the fast we choose. The word of God comes to push us and to some case pull us out of our comfortable traditional definition of Christianity and become a living example of what it means to live the fullness of God's word, to live the totality of the gospel, not just to be faithful and private in our private devotions, but also in our public spaces in the public square, on our block, in our communities, in our cities, our countries, to serve the widow, the stranger, and the orphan, to feed the hungry and house the homeless, to care for the leper and the castaway, to fully live a gospel that comforts the challenged and challenges the comfortable. Today, God ever seeks a people who will risk personal discomfort to achieve a greater good. God ever searches for a people who will make the commitment to honor themselves, to honor God with all of our hearts, minds, souls, and being. God searches for a people who understand that God's concern and passion for us is not just about the state of our souls and our spirits, but also the condition of our bodies and our communities and our nation and our world. And if that is God's concern for us, then that must be our concern for each other. This is not easy work. It is so much simpler to choose one path or the other. It is so much easier to just commit ourselves to daily devotion and prayer about our social and economic equalities, to send thoughts and prayers without actually working or taking concrete action toward ending those inequities. It is also easy to spend our time marching, protesting, and agitating without undergirding our work with a spiritual or moral foundation and making the necessary connection to the spirit and souls of those for whom we are marching. So God's word comes today as a word to the spiritually minded among us, that our prayers and our devotions must be lifted above our personal needs and our personal hurts and our personal hopes and dreams for the future and combined with the hard work of hand-to-hand -hand engagement in the issues of our day. Nothing else will move God to action. And to do otherwise is to keep silent in the face of injustice. And God's word today is also a word for the activists among us. All of our marches, rallies, protests, our sign making and slogan chanting mean little if they are not built upon a spiritual foundation guided and grounded in the moral principle of love and compassion for the other. For without that, we risk becoming the very thing we march against. You see, racist and sexist people Actions and institutions are built upon the idea that some of us have less value than others of us. And unless we approach our work, our work of dismantling these institutions and these ideas from a framework of love and compassion, then we risk turning the tables and treating our oppressors and oppressive institutions with the same kind of contempt and dismissive devaluing that we ourselves are resisting. Beloved, in the end, this all comes down to a simple decision. What is the fast that you choose? 
whether you will be faithful to the call of God to be concerned about justice in the world, will we be faithful to God's dictate to our many to marry our personal devotions with social action? Will we see our brothers and sisters, even and especially those with whom we do not agree, as reflections of the divine? First John 1, uh, 4 and 20 reminds us, if anyone says, I love God, yet hates his brother, he is a liar. For whoever does not love his brother whom he has seen cannot love God whom he has not seen. And if every person is a reflection of the divine, then their needs for food, for shelter, for care, for love, for dignity and justice are also a reflection of the divine. And in that way, they are holy. Will we treat the people's needs as holy? Will we be faithful to the call of God to be God's witness in the world? What is the fast that you choose to turn down your plate? Yes. To sacrifice legitimate physical desire? Yes. To be hungry? Yes. But more, choose to fast for compla from complacency. Choose to fast from callousness and carelessness. Choose to fast from injustice. Instead, choose love. Choose care, choose concern, choose justice and righteousness, choose grace and mercy, choose compassion, choose love, choose commitment, choose faithfulness, choose God. And how do you become faithful? You simply decide to be faithful. Faithfulness is a decision. Decide. That's all. Just decide. Decide to live holy. That is to say, decide, decide to be a living reflection of God's grace, justice, peace, and love in the world. God is looking for us to lead the way, to get in God's way so God can get in ours. God is looking for us to get in the press so that God can empower us to change our situation. God is waiting for us to choose the way of faithfulness and holiness. God is looking for us to be fervent in our devotions and our prayers, to be God chasers, to follow hard after God, to be as desperate for God as the deer that pants for water. God is looking for us to feed the hungry and clothe the naked and care for the stranger and those who cannot care for themselves. God is looking for us to challenge unrighteousness in all of its forms, personal and institutional, whether it's in our house or the state house, whether it's in our relationships with each other or the relationship that our government has with our communities. God is looking for us to be justice in the world so that we can bring Bring justice to the world. God is looking for somebody who will love all and love hard, even when, especially when it's not comfortable or profitable or easy or expected. For somebody who loves the unlovable and the unforgivable, who will look beyond fault and see need just as God did when he looked God down from God's high heaven across the annals of space and time and saw you and saw me in the wretchedness and hopelessness of our sin and God chose to love us anyway, in spite of ourselves, in spite of our faults and foibles, in spite of our weaknesses and challenges. And because of God's great love for us, God looked beyond our fault. God saw our need and God made the monumental, sacrificial, nonsensical, crazy decision to send his son, his only son, to pay the price on Calvary for our waywardness, our wretchedness, and our sins so that he, the creator God of the universe, could spend eternity with us, his good, beautiful, flawed creation, just because God loves us so. Amen. can
Wasn't that a moving selection and a moving message? Though the physical doors of the chapel are closed, the chapel remains open and vibrant as we continue to support the entire Howard University community. And we need your financial contributions. In order to support the ministry of the chapel, please visit our website, chapel.howard.edu. There you will find a give link. And during this time of uncertainty, never forget the power of prayer. You may submit prayer requests through the chapel website as well. We are incredibly excited to invite our student organizations to submit calls to chapel 
So please share your announcements and your upcoming events via the CHOPPA website. As we observe the liturgical season of Lent, we invite you every Wednesday during this season to be a part of a very special session entitled, Can We Talk? There we will have reflections on our theme, Are You Ready to Go Deeper? Join us also tomorrow at 8 p.m. for another special Black History Month edition of Communal Conversations. We will discuss the importance of HBCUs on American history and culture. There will be a chance to win an e-gift card, so please tune in and find out how on all of our platforms. To stay updated on all things Chapel, follow us on social media, Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook with the handle at Howard U Chapel. Take a moment now to subscribe to our YouTube page and like us on Facebook. Lastly, wherever you're worshiping with us, please share your experience using the hashtag Sundays are for Chapel. We now welcome Dean Richardson, who will lead us in our benediction. Thank you, Bishop Daugherty, for that very powerful and moving message. Let us now prepare our hearts and minds for the benediction. We thank you, O God, for what eyes have seen, our ears have heard, and our hearts have felt. And now I said to the one who stood at the gate, give me a light that I may go out into the darkness and into the unknown. And she replied to me, go out into the darkness, go out into the unknown, but put your hand in the hand of God, and God shall be for you better than light and much safer than a known way. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and give you peace, both now and forevermore. Amen. SB 2020 is now the 26th year, and the students who are running it are probably now younger than the program has been, and that says a lot about our legacy here at Howard University. How and why did you get involved? I had friends who had done ASB before who were currently on the steering committee, and I was like, how do I be a part of that? This is something that I know I want to be a part of. Um, and at the time, they were accepting applications for freshman interns, so I applied and I got accepted to be a public relations intern. Yeah, my first time doing ASB was back my junior year of undergrad, so 2015. Um, at that time, I think we had maybe 10 sites. Yeah, I think we had 10 sites at that time, and we we could still meet in um, chapel. Like, we were meeting in the chapel. We didn't even think about going to Crampton because we didn't have that many people. You go to chapel and still have a whole world to yourself. But, like, now, ASB, over 1,000 people, 1,100 people, like, it's grown so much as far as like the size of people wanting to do it, the number of people that it's touched. And then it's grown so much that people are coming to Howard saying that, oh, I'm here because I talked to somebody that was on ASB and that's why I want to do it. And like people are coming in their freshman year wanting to do it. Before it used to be like, you saw a couple freshmen, but it was more so like your junior seniors that were doing it. So now it's just, it's a beautiful thing, honestly, just watching how the program has grown. The biggest way I would say has shaped me to being a leader is just um, taking me out of my comfort zone with like planning sites like I'm talking to people constantly and I'm even talking to like big people like I'm hitting up the mayor of cities I'm hitting up uh, superintendents I'm hitting up like congressmen and everything and so it before like freshman year Clara could never do that absolutely not Clara <laughs> freshman year Clara would be like you must got the wrong person because <laughs> it's not me. So I think alternative spring break has definitely helped me find my place as a student leader in general, um, especially with the office of the dean of the chapel here at Howard University. 
um, this entire space is dedicated to be service learning. Um, and so we often say that ASB is a learning lab, but oftentimes we're just kind of like, okay, what does that really mean? It means that you're hands-on, some days you're in the trenches, some days, you know, it's not gonna be easy. Some days it's gonna be as difficult as to where you wanna quit and you're telling yourself like, nah, this isn't for me anymore. Um, but I think what's so empowering about ASB in particular is because I'm surrounded by so many like-minded individuals. And I think part of the process of Alternative Spring Break is that we spend the late nights in Carnegie. Um, I guess tonight is one of those nights that we're probably gonna be here until 4 a.m. But hey, you know, hopefully you don't have an 8 a.m. But part of that is making sure that we do our part to make sure that you all as students and as faculty and as safety liaisons and other people supporting us throughout our entire journey for alternative spring break can really see the fruits of your labor um, and what it really takes in order to make this trip happen. And oftentimes we talk about what we don't see. And so this right here, these are the things that you don't see. Now to growing concerns about the deadly coronavirus officially hitting the U.S. Here in New York City this morning, the mayor has announced two more people have tested positive for the virus. Many schools around the world, as you know, have shut down, some for extended periods of time as this virus spreads. With travel restrictions or advisories in place for several countries, the global airline industry is bracing for major losses. The biggest hardship happened two, three days ago. The decision was made to not... Um, allow any of the sites that need to go through an airport to travel in that way because it would be our worst nightmare for anything to happen to you that is not within our plan. And so I'm asking you to please um, use your creativity, come up with some solutions and ideas um, to help uh, make this trip impactful, not just for you, but for those who you will uh, encounter. Um, this is part of the, the, it's really part of the learning process on how do you, how do you really recover and um, make a difference uh, with these setbacks. It's part of the learning experience. Finding out that my site, Oakland, California, which my co-site coordinator, Danae, and I had spent five to six careful months planning, suddenly, due to the coronavirus outbreaks, university canceled all flights literally seven days before dispatch day. Um, so that was the biggest hardship. And then not only was our site canceled, but then um, we were presented with a new site of Nashville, Tennessee. So it was like, you know, our, at the moment, like in the present time when we were receiving the news, it was like, your site's canceled. And we also needed to plan a new site in seven days, which was just like a lot. Um, so the biggest hardship has just been having to like, switch gears mentally, obviously like plan a new site in seven days, but um, it definitely hasn't been as stressful as it could be because I do have five other site coordinators now. Um, and yeah, everybody on steering committee has just been really supportive. Other site coordinators, um, Joseph and Andrea, everybody's been pitching in, helping us. Everything happens for a reason. Um, so yeah, that's just, that's been a hardship, but it's definitely been a, like, it's challenged me to grow. We have ourselves a pandemic. The World Health Organization says the global coronavirus outbreak has reached pandemic status. The NBA is suspending the season. I say that understanding that as we speak, the game in Dallas is continuing. American, Howard, University of Maryland, Georgetown are among the area's universities shifting to online coursework and limiting access to campus. I want to thank you all for, uh, I've been around ASB this now for my fourth year. Um, so you all really made this time for me amazing. Uh, I really grown. I know, I know sometimes it can be a little serious, but that's just how much I care about this program. Um, I really thank you all for just continuing to day in, day out, do everything that you can to continue to show, to show um, the world, to show how university that you care, that you truly serve, you truly are servant leaders. I want you all to know and take every lesson that we have had every day, everything that you've built, every call you've made, every person you've contacted, just know that was a community that you were trying to touch. That was a community you were trying to outreach. And everyone, every single person on this committee, you played a part in this. You really did. So with, with that, this. we just want to let everybody know, I know we kind of 
have it in our bags and have it in our auras. But at this time, the decision has been made by our wonderful administrators and the people who support us to this program and also leaders from the president's office that ASB will um, not continue in its traditional capacity this year. Like your leader said, it doesn't end today. Um, what we need for you all to do is just let the message that we shared resonate and um, know that you have options and we are here for you, we support you. Um, anything that you need, let us know. Don't think that any of this is on your shoulders. Know that there are so many people who have been watching this program, the entire university. There's something significant uh, for you, for all of us here. Um, and we have to figure this out, and somehow we will. So you should be proud of what you've done, tell your story, <laughs> I want to thank you. The staff wants to thank you for all the tremendous work that you, you've done and will do. I just want you to do something for me, just being silent, just for a moment. And I want you to, to as difficult as this moment, just close your eyes and just capture this moment for me, just, just for a second. And I want you to think about somebody else other than yourself and, and just, as Joseph said, give them love. Um, something and support them um, because it's so important that you support each other in this moment. And then ask the question. We thank you for allowing us to participate in this moment. We thank you for allowing us to gain 60, 70 other family members. And thank you, Lord, for protecting us. It's in your darling son Jesus' name that we do pray. Amen. Amen. Um, so when I first found out that we would not be traveling to any of our sites, I was devastated. But then I had to really step back and truly understand that it's bigger than me. Think and about all. why did this situation or why did whatever happened happen for me or for you. Um, and so I challenged my committee and I had to challenge myself as well.